Welcome to Series 6. We really hope you enjoyed our chat with John Adamus last week, and that you all got some great ideas and inspiration from it. This week starts a brand new series discussing Blue Planet with Jeff Barber and Rich Howard. Are you supporting the OneShot Patreon? You should be. The Patreon supports not just OneShot and Campaign, but other great shows like Neoscum, Warda, and us! If you like what we are doing, which I assume you do because you are listening to this intro, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, Just $5 a month will get you access to the Secret Archive, which has some awesome content like past Gen Con panels, extra episodes of Campaign, and will soon have some stuff from your favorite show, Character Creation Cast. Also, we have a Discord server, and if you join it, it will have members. If you want to chat about things you heard on our show, have cool concepts you want to share, or if you just want to chat with other folks who love RPGs as much as you do, come join us at discord.charactercreationcast.com. We'll also put a link to the server in the show notes for your convenience. We would really love to see you guys in there and to chat about super cool concepts that you guys have. Yeah, or life or other things. Yes, I mean, we can also talk about other things, but mostly characters. Exactly. Um, And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, where we read a review. Uh, This one is titled My Favorite RPG Podcast by Ghost4812 from the USA. None of the RPG podcasts that I listen to get me as hyped to actually play tabletops as Creation Cast. You bring joy to me and many others. You should be proud of what you've accomplished with this show. Thank you, Ghost. Thank you so much. That was super sweet. And we are proud of it. And we're proud of you, too, for writing us this review. (laughs) Yes. And if you want to make us proud, like Ghost has made us proud, please go ahead and write a review for us. Uh, The easiest place to do that would be Apple Podcasts, uh, right through the iTunes app. And uh, we'll be able to get that and get it into one of our show openers. Hey, Ryan, can I tell you a fun fact? Yes. People can also leave us reviews on our Facebook page. Oh, that's true. We already have one review there, but it's from somebody who also left us one on iTunes. So, sorry, Kyle, it doesn't count if you do it twice. <laughs> but we love you anyway. We do. We we, we, are, we appreciate your review, but we're not going to read it again. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we run out, and then we will. Yeah. So, write us some more reviews so we don't have to read Kyle's review again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, with all of that out of the way, let's get to the show. Yeah, enjoy. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I welcome two very special guests. First up, we have Rich Howard, host of the Whelmed the Young Justice Files podcast, devoted to analyzing the Young Justice television series. He is also one of the creators of Descent into Midnight, a Powered by the Apocalypse RPG, and creator of an alchemist class for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Welcome, Rich. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. Joining Rich today is Jeff Barber, original creator for the game that we are going to be covering today, actually. Blue Planet version 2, published by Biohazard Games, a futuristic role playing game that takes place on an alien water world. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate being here. We are so excited to have you both here with us. I'm really, I can't wait to talk about this game. Yeah. Ah, Me too. (laughs) So Rich, we'll start with you. Do you want to tell everybody a little bit more about yourself and any other stuff that you've got going on? Sure. Yeah. So um, as you mentioned, I'm one of the co-hosts and co-creators of Whelm the Young Justice Files podcast, where we analyze uh, Young Justice, the DC Comics animated TV series. But we do more than just analyze the show um, kind of within itself. We, we broaden our net 
so to speak, and talk about storytelling and uh creation in general and uh seeing as it was uh co-created by myself and uh the caleb g from uh the rpg academy uh role-playing games do come up from time to time <laughs> um uh, in fact we had a masks uh masks one shot where we invited brendan conway who created masks onto the show to uh, run a game for us uh between seasons one and season two that was brilliant um so yeah if you're interested in that uh the Venn diagram crossover of gaming and Young Justice or DC Comics. Pop over there for that. Uh, Descent into Midnight, uh, as you mentioned, is a uh, Powered by the Apocalypse role-playing game where you are playing sentient aquatic creatures on an alien world, um, protecting their community from a physical and existential threat. I'm developing that with Taylor Labresh from The Leviathan Files, Richard Kreutz Landry from Origami Gaming, and uh, Brandon Leon Gambetta, who you've had on the show, is also mm-hmm. on our team. And I am super excited to have him on because um, if you listen to him on your guys' episode, you can tell how both excited and skilled the man is. So there are those two major projects. And then before I got into doing what I do now, I have a degree in marine biology uh, from back in the day, which is kind of how I got fed into this and discovered Blue Planet uh, 20 years ago last year, Jeff, right? Yeah, 20 year? years. 20 years so ago. We're going old school year. today. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, aquatic, I was like, I want more of aquatic gaming. Nobody does need all these aquatic monsters and the Dungeon Master's Guide, the Monster Manual in, in D&D, and nobody ever writes these aquatic adventures. And then I got my wish came true with Blue Planet, so... <laughs> Awesome. And then, Rich, what do you do in your free time then? <laughs> well, I'm a nurse. <laughs> My free time, I'm a nurse. I'm a dad. I do all that kind of stuff. So I'm also a, I don't know, I'm a guest on podcasts, which is also always, yeah. always an honor. You so, may know Rich from other podcasts. From lots yeah. of, actually, if you if you get interested in some of the stuff we're talking about today, I was just on, um, as of this recording, I was just on a podcast called Get Hype which is a brilliant podcast with Ali and Mel who just invite people on who are excited about whatever and mm-hmm. invite them on to talk about the thing they're excited about. And, uh, yeah. well, I'm excited about marine biology stuff. Yeah, so, I think Rich's, Rich's uh, secret goal is to be on all podcasts. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I would not turn that invitation down. And fair warning, you may not want to listen to those episodes in the dark in a bathtub. Because okay. uh, we've heard some pretty bad experiences about that. <laughs> okay, so the deep the deep ocean can get a little scary. It wasn't my intention to. Sc- Allie got up and left the room one time. It was not my intention to scare her that bad. Um, but it was That's a good nature. We had a lot of fun. It is nature's fault. Yep. I mean, you bring up the barrel eye and bobbit worms, and people yes. scared you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here, Rich. You bet. And Jeff, how about yourself? Uh, well, um, I'm, I'm here mostly because Rich inspired me to get back into the gaming industry <laughs> and, and introduced, introduced me to this whole idea of, of promotion through podcasting. So um, uh, that's been a boon. Uh, I was part of the team that wrote Blue Planet, uh, as Rich pointed out, 20 years ago. Um, I do want to make sure I shout out to my partner, Greg Benage, especially because he's oh, yeah. the okay. one who's primarily responsible for this. Um, the V2 mechanics that we'll be making characters in today. Nice. Um, he uh, was essential to Blue Planet. It would never have seen the light of day had he not gotten involved. And for anyone who's familiar with Fantasy Flight Games output during the 2000s, um, anything to do with role playing was done under his sort of auspices. He was their role playing director, uh, among other things, for a long time. Um, so I just want to make sure to to credit him where it's due because Blue Planet is the game it is because of his his uh, contributions. Nice. Um, but I was out of it for a long time. I mean, we did Blue Planet. I, I did uh, um, another game for actually uh, kind of a, a, a work for hire job for Fantasy Flight called Midnight, which was um, sort of put out during the big sort of era of D20 games. Uh, and it's essentially uh, what if Sauron won and it's oh. 100 years later. Um, and that had a pretty good run, but that's, um, like I said, done under the auspices of fantasy fight. Um, but then I kind of got out of the, the game writing for a long time and just played games. Um, but then a few years ago, uh, I couldn't shake a, an idea I had for, for a new game, um, on the narrative end of the spectrum and, um, sort of, sort of got more and more serious about it until some people encouraged me to actually publish it. 
and then we did the whole Kickstarter thing. So last year we kickstarted Upwind, which nice. is essentially a, a love letter to Studio Ghibli adventure films like Castle in the Sky or oh, Valley cool. of the Wind. The pitch I usually give people is that uh, as if Treasure Planet, Disney's Treasure Planet, had a head-on collision with Ralph Bakshi's Wizards, and then we put <laughs> out a, a, the resulting flames with a whole lot of Castle in the Sky by Studio Ghibli. Um, it's extremely narrative, so it's the polar opposite of the simulationist nature of, of Blue Planet. Um, it's a stakes-based game that's driven by hands of playing cards. Uh, nice. And character creation is, is also very different uh, as the characters are based on descriptive phrases instead of actual like uh, spelled out stats. So that's very different. We're in the process of releasing that and it should be hitting the shelves in the next couple of months, hopefully. So I'm, I'm, I'll be glad to get that to backers. Very cool. In my day day job, I am um, a teacher and and one of the things I teach is marine science. So and I, I, I took it to heart when somebody, some, some English teacher I had in high school said, write what you know. Uh, and that's essentially the reason uh, Blue Planet is about uh, a water world is because that's kind of what I knew. Yeah. It's, it's marine, it's marine biology, oceanography porn, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I read some stuff where people were trying to write things and I was like, eh, I guess it's okay. I guess it's what I'm going to get. And then I picked up blue planet and I was like, oh, what is this magic? <laughs> and then I just kept reading it. And then some of the, the supplements are ridiculous. We'll talk about that later. Rich, the check's yeah. in the mail. You can tone it down. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need a check. I already own four copies well, of Ancient I Echoes. know. You've already, you've already <laughs> probably contributed more to Blue Planet's uh, bottom line than any single customer we've ever had. So. <laughs> uh, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, Jeff and I met, met. We talked a little bit online a little bit, but we didn't meet for the first time until... Was it yeah, we've, two we've years known ago? of each other for probably a decade at least. At least, yeah. Um, through the old um, there's a Yahoo group, and uh, I emailed you at one point in time about possible novel novelizations and some stuff. Oh, like all right, that. I remember that. Yeah, but then um, it was two. Was it two years ago? Yeah, it was two years ago with Upwind when uh, you said you had a new thing, and I was like, "Oh, you got a new thing? Come to Gen Con. I'm introducing you to everyone." Which you did. <laughs> And uh, that uh, check that box off. Um, and then you had the Kickstarter, which was great. And then last year, I actually got to 20th anniversary of Blue Planet at the 50th anniversary of Gen Con. You ran a Blue Planet game for me, and um, I had a big old fat, you know, bucket list check off with that game. It was it was amazing. Yeah, I, I think was a lot so of people got jealous that checked off. of that game. Like everybody yeah. was tweeting about it after it happened because this was. The 50th Gen Con was my first to Gen Con. Um, oh. and everybody was tweeting about it. And I was like, this is amazing. I want to be a part of that. Yeah. Uh, well, fortunately and unfortunately, some of the tweets were like, uh, like Nitai Dasa tweeting at two o'clock in the morning, like eight hours after the game going, I have so many questions and the answers will bring me no solace. <laughs> so, you know, that was the kind of game it was. It was uh, emotionally wrecking and uh, one of, the, it, I was going to say one of the best, but it is, it was absolutely the best game I've run or played in, in 40 years. It was, well, it was uh, the best table I've ever run for. So that it was the, breathtaking. It all the difference. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. The players were awesome. I love hearing about experiences like that with games that like mm -hmm. where you have those moments where you're like this, this is I I had a game like that at a catacon where I had a moment of like, oh, this is everything that I have wanted a game to be right. for years. Right. And it feels so good. Yeah. Yeah. It was. We, it was yeah. Jeff was Jeff. Jeff was shaking afterwards and he was running the game. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, enough of that. I'll talk about that all day. But, <laughs> We're really excited that you guys are both here. I'm. This is going to be so much fun. Um, so should we go ahead and now we can start talking about the game? Jump right in and find out exactly what this what this game is all about. What's in a game? So let's start with the setting of Blue Planet. Uh, reading through the book, there is a lot of rich backstory that encompasses the world. Uh, but could you give us a, a brief ex explanation of where and when this game takes place? Uh, well, it takes place on Earth's first extrasolar colony planet. Um, it's been dubbed Poseidon. Uh, and it turns out that it's a water world with about 97% ocean coverage. Um, 
on the other side of uh, what people first uh, think is a naturally occurring wormhole and something like, I forget the actual distance, something like 15 light years from Earth. Uh, but then through 35, 35, oh, there you go. Because I read it this morning. <laughs> uh, and, but as the game sort of, as the meta plot, which was also common in the 90s of this of the game sort, sort of develops, it becomes more and more apparent that it might not be an, a natural wormhole. Oh, the plot oh, yeah. thickens. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> And so the the colony itself was uh, originally just a scientific expedition uh, until uh, something was discovered on, in the crust of the planet called called xenosilicate, or uh, later in the slang long john. It was a, a mineral that could be used as a template for refining genetic engineering, and that led to a, a gold rush where um, it was now sort of an economic viability to colonize a planet because this stuff was so valuable in that it allowed um, for complete genetic engineering, including uh, longevity treatments and essentially making people uh, immortal. Oh, wow. Um, and so so there was a very much the intention to create a a futuristic gold rush uh, as, as the sort of primary driving force for this mad dash colonization of, of the planet. And it, it in part, trying to keep the economics of a of a, a, a transolar colony viable, at least within the fiction. Mm. And one of the one of the things that I found the most fascinating was where things get a little complicated, which is where um, genetically modified settlers are sent to Poseidon, and then uh, they're supposed to get uh, resupply runs from Earth, but then they don't arrive. And the reason they don't arrive is because of an ecologic disaster that hits Earth. Oh. And so they, the Earth recovers from this ecologic disaster, but it takes about 100 Seven, years. Yeah, about 75 years, yeah. Yeah. So it takes about 75 years to recover and then another, like, maybe, whatever, 25 years to just get, I don't know, <laughs> running again. Uh, anyway, so it takes a long time. And so they're like, oh, well, those colonists we sent must be dead. Because we didn't send any resupply, <laughs> resupply run. But let's go, let's go check out, the, you know, this this planet again. So they send colonists to the planet, and they find out that the original colonists were still alive, and they, you know, and, and there's a whole generation or multiple generations that were born on the planet, and that's their home. And so you have these um, these high tech colonial. Um, settlers coming in for this gold rush and and wanting to like you know uh, monetize a whole lot of aspects of the planet, but you have these you know uh, these human settlers. Some have been genetically modified. Most have been genetically modified um, to be able to live on the planet well. Um, for example, with um, uh, what they call aquaforms. So either humans that have been genetically adapted to be able to hold their breath for an hour and increased myoglobin in their muscles and so on and so forth, or what are called squids, which are uh, humans that have been modified to be able to draw oxygen, like with gills directly out of the water itself. Um, and so you have this kind of native quote unquote primitive culture and this incoming high tech culture uh, which is one of like 25 different plot <laughs> elements that you could uh, you could pull on to be be creating games for the for the setting. In addition to all, so there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of other things, civil war even, um, mm -hmm. is, which uh, I get really excited about because like as excited yeah. as you are about the marine biology part of it, I was like, ooh, right. colonization, and right. you know, as a political scientist, that's my jam. Right. So that's one <laughs> I was of the really excited about that kind of stuff. stuff about the setting, it makes it, it, it's my favorite science fiction setting, uh, I have to say, because it, it is not just a, where there are some definitely some wonderful advantages to being able to, with our modern uh, kind of uh, mentality about role-playing games, to tell a specific story with a specific role-playing game, that a role-playing game is supposed to evoke a, a specific experience. Mm -hmm. um, there is something to be said about a rich, broad, deep setting that you can tell a lot of stories in and not many science fiction settings are like that. If you're running a Star Trek game or you're running a Star Wars game, you can have some flexibility within that setting, but there's a particular feel to Star Trek or a particular yeah. feel to 
um, Star Wars and what Blue Planet offers from you know my perspective, being someone who didn't write the game, but someone who loves and read, read, reads the game, is that you can tell a wide range of stories from from street level, you know, crime to, uh, you know, politics, to rescue, to survival, to exploration, to discovering what this thing is about this wormhole that is apparently potentially not actually a naturally occurring stable wormhole and what that may or may not lead to. And I don't want to like spoil anything. (laughs) (laughs) No, it seems like there's a lot of, um, a lot of threads that you can pull on pretty easily. um, just from the very basic knowledge of the meta plot, Mm -hmm. which is kind of nice because I think a lot of those nineties games having, having meta plot sometimes is a high barrier to entry for people just because there's, it feels like there's a lot to know, but it, this one at least feels like um, you could have a pretty base knowledge and still right. operate pretty That's easily. It's actually been the most common criticism of the game is that there's too much, that the learning curve is, is steep and people feel intimidated by trying to learn what's going on, but then also figure out what kind of campaign to run because there's no default campaign. You know, yeah. A lot of games have an expectation that these are what the heroes are and these are what the heroes do. Uh, these are what the PCs do, but Blue Planet didn't have that. The intention was to create a a living, breathing world, uh, sort of across the the ecological and socioeconomic political spectrums, and then you could just live in that world and play however you wanted to. But I think that was is still proves to be a little much for some gaming tables, um, and requires sort of a, a level of dedication that something a little more directed. Um, with a little more open background doesn't necessarily require. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's one thing that I'm I'm learning so far doing this podcast too, is that it takes all kinds and you know, the things that one person really, really loves about a game, another person looks at and goes, that's why would I want that? Uh So I I think some things having a really structured meta plot and a really um, kind of tight world to play in. Some people really, really like that. And other people really enjoy having um, something totally open. I kind of like something in the middle where you have like different things that you can kind of explore, but having at least some structure to it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, there are some advantages too, because so the game that we were referring to at Gen Con, we were a rescue team. Um, which is a really good, solid way to introduce characters to the setting, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, because it allows the the excuse for exploration. It allows the excuse for being hired by political organizations or, or whatever it happens to be. Or if there's a disaster, you can you can get people lost and have to do survival stuff. It's there's lots of things you can do. Um, but in that particular game, we thought we were in a political intrigue game. We thought that we were sent into, there were some missing people. And so we went to go try to help because we were a rescue team. So we thought that we were in a political game where one political group was trying to sabotage a different political group. Uh, About two hours in, we started to realize that we may actually be in an existential horror instead. (laughs) <laughs> and like any good horror game, which is not, I think, what, great, what, uh, what Jeff was necessarily intending, but like we kept like, no, that can't be happening. No, no, no. There's some other, there's some other reason that's happening. There's some, no, there's got to be a logical explanation for this. There kind of was, but it was based on nothing we had knowledge of. And so when uh, the reality of what was happening started to make itself uh, apparent, it scared the crap out of us in the best possible way. Like it was amazing. And if you're having a game like, um, I don't know, like a game like masks, right. Or you're or even, or a game like something even more specific, like say um, night witches where you're playing Russian female fighter pilots in world war two. Like you're looking for a very specific kind of game experience. And I think that's great for people who don't have a lot of time in the modern day to sit down and say, what do I want to play? What do I want to experience and sit down and do that? But a game, uh, a world that's so rich and, and deep as Poseidon is um, and varied, you can have one game to the next game can stay fresh because you can have a, a whole different kind of game every time you play or realize that you're in an existential horror. <laughs> that's the best kind of horror though where it sort of like slowly creeps up oh, and no, you don't know what's exactly happening, what was happening. And, like, at one oh. point i made this horrifying realization based on something jeff had said i turned to darcy ross i pointed out what he had actually said and darcy freaked out <laughs> oh. 
Uh. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, did that what he just said? What did he just say? That's it. What? Oh my God. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> Um, but you also have to have a table that's signed up for it, it, that's willing to dive into that. I mean, if somebody yeah. wants to do plot politics and ends up in a horror game, sometimes that can be a bad that cannot be the best. Right. But right. in this case, it worked out great. So, yeah, there's there's upsides and downsides. So we've talked about this a little bit, but and it sounds like it kind of depends on what sort of game you play. But in a game of Blue Planet, what what are your characters doing? Like, what is the. You know, in D and D, you go adventuring. You, you know, in L five R, you are samurai. Like, what do you do in this that, game? That depends on the table's interests, right? And I think, like I mentioned before, it it is a bit of a barrier uh, to entry for some GMs because there's not an obvious sort of plot trail to follow. You have to have a story that you want to tell. That, and you can tell any kind of story you want. Uh, you can have everything from local family troubles to globe spanning um, sort of cryptic mysteries about the the meta plot and then everything in between. Uh, there are many factions that are provided e- exactly for that reason. So you can play corporate intrigue or you can play native insurgents or you can play geo law enforcement or scientists or street thugs. Uh, there's even a bunch of, uh, I love games that involve like sort of nefarious people, but people are doing the right thing. So there's all kinds of stuff in there about um, various crime families and syndicates and and that sort of thing. So you can use those tropes and pressures. Um, so really, uh, I think more than most games, you have to come into it with a a story that you want to tell, and then that will structure what the what the characters do. The longest running campaign I ran was we called it Red Sky Charters, and this. I, I probably should point out Blue Planet has a very kind of Western feel to it, a uh, Wild West kind of feel to it intentionally. Okay. I mean, we've got marshals and we've got bounty hunters and we've got even a place called Kansas where they raise cattle and there's horses, right? Like it's it's um, intended to have a very Wild West feel to it because um, we're trying to evoke some of the tropes of the frontier. Mm-hmm. Um, and And it actually predates Firefly. So I always have to point that out because People feel like we've been planning. They're like, oh, this is just like Firefly. <laughs> this campaign I was running, Red Sky Charters, um, was essentially Firefly, but instead of a ship, they had a location, uh, just a, a sort of a beachfront location and a boat. And they were a family, um, an extended family of sorts. And they just kept having the same sorts of adventures that the, happened in Firefly, right? Wide ranging based on them trying to do jobs, but ultimately the jobs never being the focus of the thing. And then the, random events around them being the, the, the focuses of the story. Um, and what that allowed me to do was play test all kinds of different ideas I was having for the setting. And so not only it could have different kinds of characters, but they could go from political intrigue to simple survival story to sort of an alien mystery um, within a series just as many weeks, right? Yeah. Um, and so games can be designed in Blue Planet to, to play off of those options as well. Very cool. So... Uh, outside of the rule book, um, before we get into anything else, uh, if people are interested in playing this game, what sort of materials are they going to need? Um, like what sort of dice are needed? And is there anything else that's special that they might need to play this game? Nothing special. Um, the version two books, there's two of them. There's the player's guide, which you need for character generation and, and mechanics. And then the moderator's guide, which has most of the basic setting. So you, it's It'd be tough to play just with the player's guide. I'd I'd recommend the moderator's guide too, um, for the GM at least. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of beyond that, each player just needs character sheet and three D ten. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then I will point out that the moderator's guide, as I will point out for most of the supplements as well for Blue Planet. Personally, I think there's some of the best written supplements I've ever read, and some of this is how they're laid out. And the moderator's guide, for example, there's not. I mean, there's there's this whole world developed an ecology separate from Earth. So there's not really monsters, quote unquote. It's just all natural animals. But the way things developed were very, very different. And so the moderator's guide has a has a nice selection of creatures that you can run into. But one of the things that was very subtle that that Jeff and his team did was they took a very simple thing that evolved on our planet and changed it on Poseidon 
to make everything really alien. So, and that thing is the development of complex eyes. Oh. So we have, we have these compound eyes structures that are very similar to like an octopus, for example. And a lot of mammals do. We relate to each other through our eyes. On Poseidon, compound eyes didn't evolve. All the animals on that planet have eye spots. So even if you see something that looks like an analog of something on Earth, like it, it looks kind of like a monkey maybe, when it turns around, it has no eyes. Yeah. It's, it's an eyeless monkey with eye spots on its face. And that simple change in a perfectly reasonable evolutionary uh, reasoning makes everything feel horrifyingly alien. Even if it's a very friendly animal, it mm -hmm. just doesn't feel it's familiar yet different in a way that tweaks you. And yeah. the moderators guide talks about things like that and survival and different uh, and ecologies and, and, uh, and gives you uh, quite a, quite a wide range of examples of uh, surface creatures and aquatic creatures to make it really feel different. So the player's guide and the moderator's guide will give you plenty of stuff to work with, but all the other supplements brilliantly laid out and written. That's a really cool, like scientific sort of, change too though because it makes sense that things would evolve differently just i mean all of genetics is just like small tiny mistakes you know somewhere in the in the genetic code and so that's like a fascinating little piece to just change like one little thing and have you know everything from there sort of spider web out right yeah. and, uh, and all of the world is like that so if you think that's interesting that's just like one thing. We're just like, I, have, I got the game yeah, for you. I got the game for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just I, that stuff fascinates me as somebody who does, you know, I work in cancer research in my day job, too. And that's, you know, what so much of that is, is like one tiny little genetic change that mm -hmm. messes everything up. And so. Well, another thing, like from the planetary oceanography kind of aspect to it, but the fact that it's 97 percent water means that there's no large land masses. And when there's no large land masses like continents on our planet and you get a you get a tropical storm, the tropical storms hit our coast and break up. But if there's no giant land masses to help break those things up, they develop into superstorms until they blow themselves out. So imagine living on these islands and archipelagos and having these giant superstorms that are like nothing we've seen on our planet come yeah. blowing through. How do you survive that? How do you, how do you live through that? Like that in and of itself could be a horrifying series of adventures, just, just trying to deal with the consequences of something like that. And again, it's just based on a perfectly reasonable change, mm -hmm. like on a planet. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> right? right? See? Oh, it's so cool. <laughs> ah. Okay. Ah. So <laughs> I, I feel like almost like we we there's no way we have time for our our next question really, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, which is what do you, what would you say is unique about this game? What is the thing that makes Blue Planet a different game rather than like a a different setting for another game? Does that right, make sense? Well, I actually made some notes about this question. <laughs> I think you're right. It would be hard if we started talking about individual items from the the book specifics um so maybe it's easier to talk about the themes mm -hmm. i mean the intention was when we designed it we didn't think it was going to do this is way back before kickstarter and all that kind of thing so everything you had to kind of bootstrap and and do without social media and through distributors and that kind of thing we we were afraid that that if we were able to put out the first book that would be it so we wanted it to be as complete as possible and, and as full as possible because we figured that was our only shot. Uh, and we went um, for a as much realism as possible. There were a lot of things that ended up changing throughout production just to make it more you know realistic with air quotes because we're talking about science fiction, but we wanted everything to be as, at least as plausible based on 1997 technology and science. Um, <laughs> yeah, right? Because some things have changed. Who saw cell phones coming like they did? Uh, but yeah, so we wanted it to be as real as possible. It was the 90s and games had moved from what characters could do to sort of what the environment was like, uh, what what was the world around the characters doing. And so we wanted it to be simulationist in a way. We wanted it to feel like a real world or at least a plausible world. The thing I like best about role playing is feeling like I am in the world that's being played. And I wanted that to be sort of a central tenet of 
of the game. And I think it it succeeds because of that realism, at least in in that goal. Simulationist sort of environments are not for everybody. And and you can tell because there just aren't that many games like it. Or that sorry, not many games that do the simulationist thing. Right. Um, certainly anymore. Um, but that create worlds that are are sort of intentionally that detailed um, and specific. Uh, wanted the ecology to be part of that realism. Uh, and so there are not only scientific ecological themes embedded in the book, but there's a lot of sort of environmentalism embedded in the book, which was simply something close to my heart and, and important thematically um, still, but certainly through the, the 90s when we were writing this. And and so that's in not only part of the sort of meta impression that the book leaves. And in fact, it's been a source of criticism for the book um, from people who aren't necessarily into that kind of thing. But um, it's also the ultimate message of the book, if there could be said to be a message in a role-playing game, right? Because we got the natives that are trying to protect their home against this economic invasion that's happening um, and the disregard that that is being shown to the planet, um, which is being sort of a re- repeat of what was happening on earth and led to the, the the troubles they had on earth in the first place. And then of course we tried really hard to make it hard, hard science fiction. There aren't a lot of role-playing games that can really kind of be called hard sci-fi. Uh, and so we tried to make everything, even, even the existence of the wormhole as plausible as theories of the nineties would allow Mm -hmm. Um, and still make it gameable. Right. I mean, we didn't want it to be like, you know, physics and problem solving, but we wanted it to read like, there was uh, a reasonable thread of technology through the whole thing and um, that all of the ecological and, and sort of scientific principles were based on, on real facts. Nice. So how did you, how did you go about making sure that, I mean, obviously that's an area of interest for you, but how do you go about making sure that it is as scientifically accurate or plausible as possible? Were you guys interested in the scientific side of it to begin with? Or, I mean, because I think a lot for a lot of game developers, it's, it's you know, a love of the storytelling and, and that kind of stuff. And we bring what we know to it. But sure, this sure. has like an extra added level of... Well, I'm a marine science teacher in my day job. Um, so I was already halfway there. <laughs> and, and it's an occupational hazard, I guess. But you want to be... You know, I'm not going to teach the subject and then write it in a sloppy way. So that was sort of went hand in hand. And it was part of the intent to be sort of a a realistic slash simulationist environment. When we did have questions beyond our scope, my partner, very intelligent guy, but trained as an economist. So um, (laughs) I think some of that comes through. But (laughs) neither one of us were sort of, you know, and he had any real knowledge of... um, astronomy or of um, the physics associated with with uh, space travel and that kind of thing. And so we would reach out to some people and, and consult with them or um, actually got a couple of people to do some freelance work when it came to that kind of thing. Even the, even the picking of the, of the planet that we, that we put uh, Poseidon on um, Lambda Serpentis two was based on, what we knew about exoplanets in the nineties and some actual real stars that might be able to, to, you know, have a earth like planet. Um, but we went to a, a physicist for that information. Um, we went up to a physicist for all the orbital information, make sure that our, our moons and our, and our um, planetary orbits were reasonable, at least within, within the realm of possibility. Okay. Of course, we know a lot more about exoplanets now. Um, and I don't know, Rich, if you've seen all that stuff that's come out recently about all the water worlds they're discovering. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Like, pretty cool stuff. It's yeah. nice to see. It's nice to see some of the things that we've kind of guessed at um, becoming scientific fact, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, I think that that's an interesting level of sort of research and stuff that has to go into it. That I think that we don't have to necessarily do with a lot of other kinds of games, especially the ones that are set in more fantasy settings and you, there aren't as many like hard sci- we have lots of sci-fi games but there aren't very many that are like a hard sci-fi mm-hmm. that's an added level of of work and authenticity that you have to you have to really put in a lot of effort to get to and I, I think that i think that speaking about stuff like that i think that there is a general impression the idea that hard sci-fi like a hard sci-fi setting reduces 
imagination, like it reduces options in some way. When you're reading like those two things I already just shared about the compound eyes and the superstorms, right? One of the things that blew me away because my emphasis of study was on marine mammal cognition and um, sleep physiology, bioacoustics. And so when I read uh, when I read about like, well, how are they handling? Because in Blue Planet, we haven't discussed this yet, but there are uplifted uh, cetaceans. So a cetacean is a, is a dolphin or a whale, right? Mm-hmm. So in this game, as part of this genetic uh, manipulation that they've been doing, they uplifted, uh, which is a term that was introduced by David Brin in a series called The Uplift War, this idea of taking a, an animal that has a, a very high level of intelligence, but quote unquote, bringing them up to our level of intelligence. And that's showed up in a few settings, but it is handled really weirdly, except in Blue Planet, where they've taken this idea of this uplift, this uplifting concept. And then he wrote Ancient Echoes, which is this entire supplement focusing on cetaceans and what it is like to be in their head. And this idea of the uplift process basically took the line or barrier between your conscious mind, the the dolphin's conscious mind and their subconscious mind and removed it. So there they live both consciously and subconsciously at the same time. Everything is one. So their intuition is incredibly high, right? To the point where people think, Oh, they must be psychic or whatever. There's no psychic things in blue planet, but the way that they wrote this section, they have a whole section that said it basically, and I use this phrase all the time, if you're going to play a, a seat, you're going to play a cetacean character, do not play a human in a dolphin suit, mm-hmm. right? If you're going to, and I take this to other games, if you're going to play an elf, don't play a human in an elf suit, <laughs> right? <laughs> like you can have touches that you, that you want to humanize them so that you can relate to them, but try to be inside that headspace to present that character. And that whole section on, in Ancient Echoes talking about how to do that with a completely non-human species is, is brilliant. And so taking that hard sci-fi aspect and looking at if we uplifted, what would that look like from a scientific, quote unquote, hard sci-fi standpoint, actually opened a door to huge amount of interesting imaginative things instead of shutting down the door to it. So using science as inspiration for these games instead of making it limiting and thinking like, oh, well, with magic, I can do whatever I want. So that means, you know, I got more choices. Well, kind of, but... That's a fascinating thing about science in general for me, though. I mean, I I have never been good at hard sciences or math or like I have a liberal arts degree and there's a reason for that. But the thing that has always fascinated me about it is that as it moves forward constantly, it takes all of these things that we thought were essentially magic and now we understand them. And so I feel like the idea that it can't be as whimsical or fantastical or Mm -hmm. creative is just absurd (laughs) right? because it's i mean every day we are moving closer and closer to these things that we thought were just absolutely bananas and could never happen um and now we understand them Mm -hmm. you know all these things that we thought were magic or you know crazy miracles are really just you know weird genetic mistakes or whatever Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. yeah, that's a that's a crazy idea that you would think that that I. And that's the thing, like, like <laughs> it's the idea of like necessity is the mother of invention, right? It, the, if someone says here you can here write a novel for me, you can write it about anything you want. Uh, I, I, you know you have no you have no framework. Or if you say like, look, I need a novel about a uh, a mutated crazy walrus that um you know ends up on another planet who's really the pilot of a spaceship. Oh, oh, okay. Well, that sounds nuts, but at least I know I have a bunch of ideas already. So yeah. those limitations actually help to guideline and inspire imagination. And I think hard sci-fi can do that. And same thing for superhero stories and all that kind of stuff. When you ground a lot of it in believable reality, then the crazy thing seems much, almost more plausible than mm-hmm. it was before. And I think we talked about that a little bit in, in one of our other episodes that... Um, I think probably was it in our L5R episode, maybe, but we talked about how having structure sometimes helps with creativity because it gives you so many little pieces to work off of. Mm -hmm. And in this case, that structure is science. Um, But in some cases, it's, you know, this 
fantasy world or right. whatever. It's the, the trope. The trope of writing novels is uh, the difference between reality and fantasy is that fantasy has to make sense. Yes. <laughs> we do have an actual section on oceanography in the game, mm-hmm. uh, basic physical oceanography so that game masters know how light works in water and sound works in water and, and those kinds of things, which I guess it's kind of funny because you don't see those sorts of um, sections in most role-playing games, no. which I guess is another it's indication. It's literally so called oceanography for gamers. So uh, it's section. just another another kind of thing that makes the game a little different, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Where you have like yes. one paragraph. I, I love D&D 5e, but there's one paragraph about like, if you're underwater, take this one thing into consideration. Yeah, it's like three sentences <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, I don't know how to run it. And I'm like, well, no wonder. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> we talked about that when we were recording um, last night, we were recording for Edge of the Empire, too, and talking about rules right. in games and things like that. And I said, I, I think it's always easier to have them and have that information in front of you and say, you know what? In this case, I'm not going to use that. It doesn't yes. apply. It's it's way better to take that option than to have to pull it from somewhere else and make it fit mm-hmm. where it you know it isn't really meant to go. You know, it's nice to always have that option to have it there and have that information in front of you and say, you know what, the sound thing doesn't really apply in this situation, or I don't want to use that mechanic, or I don't, you know. But it's good to have it there in case you do. Mm-hmm. Don't make me do the work. I don't want to do the work. You do the work for me. <laughs> <laughs> Know the rules to break the rules. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, now normally we would have looked up the Wikipedia entry for the game uh, that we're about to cover, but we've got <laughs> we're professionals. The, uh, yeah, we've got the creator of the system here with us, so uh, we might as well throw this your way, Jeff. Could you give us a quick rundown of the history of Blue Planet uh, in terms of developing it, the different versions that have come sure. out? Sure. Sure. So um, what we call V1, uh, first edition Blue Planet, was the original book. It was a single tome, and it was a percentile-based system. Very straightforward, nothing inspired, very early 90s. Um, it got the job done because my interest was looking at, at the world and what the characters could do, not really creating characters that, that then allowed you to explore what, what they were inside. We published that through Biohazard and uh, uh, along with a couple of supplements and then teamed up with Fantasy Flight, um, who at the time had hit it big with uh, Disc Wars, but didn't have any role playing games. And they, we, you know, we'd gotten some some positive acclaim. So they wanted to sort of uh, acquire a role playing title. I was getting a little tired of of the, the grind. And um, so they proposed a, a second edition. Um, the mechanics that I had written were never great. And my partner, um, sort of to, to make the second edition a reason for people to buy the second edition, he redid the mechanics and that's the, the V2 mechanics. I think they are far superior to, um, the original mechanics. They work completely differently. And I think they do a much better job of sort of meshing with the intent behind the, the sort of simulationist and, and, and realism of the game. And then, uh, Fantasy Flight held on to it for quite a while, produced a bunch of supplements. Um, I think there's eight or 10 of them. Uh, and then the license passed back to us when they decided to let it go. There was an, another uh, company that picked it up um, and that company went through several iterations. It started out as Red Brick and then it became FESA and then it became Capricious Games and they worked on some supplements of their own and they created kind of a, a V2 revised, okay. but then quickly realized that they would would rather support the the previous v2 and sort of let that sort of fade away um and that's where it sits the license is not with them anymore the license is referred to us um v2 is sort of the state of the art 20 year old state of the art um blue planet <laughs> um and uh there's talk off and on about about um, doing a, a new version of the game um one with all kinds of fancy art and some new sensibilities in terms of mechanics and some updates of the technology because, you know, cell phones. Um, so and, Rich is nodding excitedly because yeah, this yeah. is an audio well, medium. People you can't, can't prove anything. This is a podcast. <laughs> we've, got, we've got video backup. Oh, shoot. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that that's 
still a possibility, but um, right now I'm got to get upwind out the door before I can really seriously think about it. Personally, uh, Jeff, I think they're going to skip. We're going to skip straight past cell phones, and by the time Blue Planet, uh, the time frame comes around, we'll all have uh, implanted body comps. Probably, we'll be yeah. fine. Yeah, we'll Calm just come right around kind. again. Yeah, yeah. So that's where we sit. Very if cool. you if you did work on a version three, would it be like new mechanics, or is it mostly to update the the scientific um, portions of it? Is that the I, I think there. I'm gonna be hold a, you to this very officially. <laughs> well, I think, I think it would probably be a poor business decision not to revise the mechanics in some way. I really love the system that that Greg came up with, but it does. I think before we started recording, I was talking about how in my mind there's sort of three broad categories of of game mechanics. There's the early days, right, and the '80s when when it was all about what your character could do, uh, what weapon proficiencies you had, what your armor mm-hmm. class was. I think then in the nineties, it seemed like, well, what, what's, what's the world offering the characters, right? What's, what can I, my character do in the world? Um, and now it seems, and I think Rich has already mentioned this um, earlier in our conversation. It's more about what can I do inside myself? What can I feel? What can I be? What can I aspire to um, as a character? And the settings are often sort of secondary. Uh, for example, look at the, um, how, um, the explosion in Powered by Apocalypse games. It's all about what the character is inside and the and the changes that occur in those characters. And the, and the settings almost by um, design are very ephemeral and, and loose and open to any kind of interpretation. Um, so I, I imagine we would have to at least nod in that direction for Blue Planet and offer some options that would make the characters more like real people and give a modern modern player is the chance to to experience who they can be a lot like maybe the seat book sort of does um but but for some of the more standard characters yeah I, as much as i obviously love and am, have been inspired by blue planet for a long time uh descent into midnight is mechanically almost entirely opposite of blue planet yet it's going for the same goals so people are using, we don't have defined species and we don't have defined races and there's no defined culture. All that's determined at the table by the players. But what in that case, what that allows people to do is think about, oh, that one thing I heard about that's really weird about some creature I saw in a documentary this one time, I'm going to make this culture based on it. And then everybody else at the table is like, I've never heard of that before. And then everybody's on the, the net looking up whatever this crazy thing was somebody brought up. So we're inadvertently teaching, having people teach each other marine biology <laughs> at, the table. at the table. But it, it, the, the thing is, it's again, though, mechanically, it's different. The goals that Jeff, you know, where where Jeff is doing that through hard science, we went the opposite direction. Like it's full on psionics and bioengineering and craziness and no human influence at all. Where Blue Planet is, it's it's all humans all the time, pretty much. Yeah. Right. And it's all science that would scround it. Yet you can do the same kinds of things. Yet our game is, is hugely inspired by his. So mm-hmm. um, and needless to say, I think Jeff and I will be having a conversation about um, if a third you know, volume or a third edition of, of Blue Planet comes out. He and I will be discussing kind of how to modernize these mechanics. And yeah, because the richness of the the mechanics are great for what it is and what he was trying to do, like he was saying. But really, for me, the mechanics are cool and they do some really interesting things in my mind, particularly character generation. But it's the setting that blows my mind. Oh, yeah. And so uh, to have that still be present and then modernize that for a modern, you know, narrative, more narratively focused, a little less simulationist focused uh, audience is uh-huh. would really be what I would like to see. So. Definitely. Yeah, and I, th- I think he's right in that um, games really have have changed a lot, and I think that we've seen that in the just in the span of the few games that we've covered so far, just how different um, the feel is, it, particularly mechanically. I think settings are still there are some games with some really great settings that still just blow me away, but mechanically we've moved away from a lot of that crunch that games in the nineties had. It's right. much more narrative, much more um, open. If I wanted to make any kind of comparison between blue planet and something like a modern audience would appreciate, I would say mass effect. 
right? Mm -hmm. So a, a video game that has a very, has a hugely rich, deep history that's its own thing that's not influenced by the Star Trek, Star Wars kind of, you know, inertia, yet is entirely based on narrative choices and emotions and morals and, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. That's kind of what I would like to see in a third edition of Blue Planet, which I haven't mentioned to Jeff yet, and he's currently out of the room. So I'm going to have to talk to him about that. <laughs> That's what I would like to see. That would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. And you can have that sort of narrative uh, focused game and still have this really elaborate and rich setting um, that's kind of uh, the the background of Blue Planet, mm -hmm. uh, which is is really interesting because you can ter tell uh, it, if I didn't know any of the mechanics of this game, which I, I barely do anyway, <laughs> um, the setting itself is enough to draw me in and I can easily see how you can do a lot of really good narrative character driven stories in this setting mm -hmm. there was a there's a gerps version of blue planet actually it was licensed out to gerps and gerps wrote a blue planet book as well oh nice oh, yeah. i forgot about that one yeah yeah the setting the intention behind the setting was that it allowed you to to give real motivation to your characters real consequences to their actions yeah. um, and real requirements of the, of what they do to to survive and interact with other people and real um, death yeah very it's quick, a pretty lethal quick, system. Very lethal system. <laughs> yeah. Before we jump into the official part of character creation, actually making our people, um, we usually like to go over some terms that we think people will kind of need to understand in order to follow along. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a couple that we kind of made note of. The first one I wanted to talk about is attributes. Um, does one of you want to talk a little bit about exactly what attributes are in this game? Uh, sure. Sure. Um, they're the, the classic stats that um, people are familiar with from just about any older role-playing game. Um, they've got their own their own terms, things like build and and uh, dexterity and awareness. Um, but essentially, they are serving sort of that same primarily primary defining fo uh, feature. Unlike some of other games, these stats are added directly into your skill tests, your target numbers. So their their role is additive with your skills and 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 any tests you have for for the attributes themselves. There's two kinds. There's primary, which are ones that you determine through character generation, and then derived, which um, are sort of created from the primary ones. So, for example, um, your endurance is going to be based on your uh, fitness and uh, strength i believe um, it's will i think will right um so that you've got some attributes that are determined by other attributes unlike a lot of modern systems um there's quite a few of them uh relatively speaking um uh, again sort of that simulationist approach that was common in the 90s uh but one of the things i find interesting about that though is in many cases if you have someone like a constitution score or you're making a constitution save or you're having something to do with that like endurance in here has to do with your fitness and your willpower. <laughs> so think about that. That's not usually a common thing that you see in games. And I think that that's really interesting and, and important in many ways. Yeah. So that you can, with strength of will, you can power through things that your body might not look like you could do. And there are a few subtle things that happen in the game mechanics in the system to me that uh, though, you know, it, we're talking about simulationism as if it's not, you know, as if it's a maybe a, a challenge for modern gamers, there's this feeling that it feels in many ways real. Like you don't feel like, oh, I'm the smart guy. I can't be the, the tough guy, mm -hmm. right? You know, or I can't get through this because I didn't buy up my, my you know, my constitution's my dump stat or whatever. Yeah, right? it's kind of, I was thinking about dump stats. It's not, it's not a um, game that you really have dump stats or that it's really possible to dump a stat, but... I mean, you can have low stats and you can have high stats, but because we're trying to create, again, finger quotes, real people, then it's it's not as easy to get sort of the imbalance uh, associated with the classic D and D barbarian who, you know, doesn't know which end of his sword is pointy. Right. 
Which is, yeah, I, I think true of most real life people is that, you know, you have things that you're good at and things that you're not good at, but very few of us have things that we just absolutely can't for the life of us figure out. Right, right. So the attributes, I don't know how specific you want to get about it, but they include build and fitness, agility and dexterity, awareness and intellect, and presence and will. Uh, and then the derived attributes drawn from those are endurance, reflexes, strength, and toughness. Yeah. Again, like the idea of reflexes as well. So in many games, like your initiative is just based on your raw dexterity. And that always bugs me because how fast you pull a gun out is way less important to initiative than how, how situationally aware are you of what's happening around you, which has more to do with perception. And <laughs> That's why reflexes is a derived attribute. It's right. Uh, your, your dexterity and your or awareness or, and your awareness. Yeah. Yeah. So it, again, it's that thing that it's very satisfying to me because it feels like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. If you can pull your gun out fast, that's pretty helpful, but also, I, okay. If you're constantly watching everything that's around you and you're reacting before people are even doing anything, cause you can, pers- you can kind of see where things are headed. That's also really important. So it's things that I appreciate about the system. Sorry, I misspoke. Reflexes is agility, uh, average of your agility and awareness. Agility and awareness, right. Dexterity mm-hmm. is manual dexterity. Agility is body dex- body uh, Correct. movement, right? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Because technically, de- technically, dexterity has to, is a word that re- references manual dexterity as opposed to full body dexterity. So it's just kind of a thing that's driven into a lot of us if we started playing D&D that dexterity has to do with your whole body. Right. We all learned wrong. Hey, and also just, you know, hashtag I love D&D. I'm not, I'm not bashing on d and I love it. Oh, it's fine. We, <laughs> we, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's the gateway drug of role-playing games. <laughs> it's a great place to start, but you don't have to stay there. No. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts and guests, or even some of our character sheets. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Also, check the notes or the website for cool stuff to go with each character, such as dice or mixtapes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation, so go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like System Mastery. System Mastery follows Jeff and John as they scour the bargain bins of game stores across the country to bring you up to the decade reviews of failures and secret successes of RPG history.